We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. I, I had yeah. gone in there a month in advance, and, and I knew there was an invasion coming. And having taken part in several major invasions, I knew what the Russians had to be looking at. Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. Today's episode is our first part of a series of special episodes looking at the war on Ukraine. Over the next month, I will be joined by various authors and experts talking about the war on Ukraine as it's now hitting its dreadful one-year anniversary since Russian forces invaded. On today's episode, I'm joined by Malcolm Nance. Malcolm has been on this podcast before. Malcolm is an author, a media commentator on terrorism, intelligence, insurgency, and torture. He's a former United States Navy senior chief petty officer specializing in naval cryptology. And Malcolm is the author of several books, including New York Times bestseller, The Plot to Hack America, and The Plot to Destroy Democracy. And Malcolm has a new book called They Want to Kill Americans. And on today's show, Malcolm describes his first-hand experiences in Ukraine. He went out last year, and he's been on the front line in the battle against Russian forces invading Ukraine. So I think Malcolm gives us a fantastic perspective. I found this a very interesting conversation, and I hope you do as well. And all the links Malcolm mentions are in the show notes below. So pour yourself your favorite drink, sit back, and I hope you enjoy this episode. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Malcolm, welcome back to the podcast. Glad to be here. Great to have you back on. Just for the benefit of listeners, please, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, So I spent uh, 20 years in U.S. Naval Intelligence, uh, 15 more years in U.S. Intelligence Civil uh, as an intelligence contractor and and, uh, other roles. And then I went to news media. I became uh, the second largest news channel in the United States, MSNBC. I was their terrorism, counterterrorism, and intelligence analyst. And last uh, March, I quit news media uh, quite abruptly and joined the International Legion for Territorial Defense of Ukraine. So I've been a legionnaire for 10 months, uh, first with defense intelligence and then uh, with 1st Battalion Infantry, then 3rd Battalion Special Forces, and uh, left Ukraine in November. And even now, I'm running all their logistics from around the world. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So what what is the current situation on the ground in Ukraine? And what should we expect to see in the, maybe the months ahead? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a little hard when you do snapshots mm. like this, because even as we speak, people are saying that the situation is stable, um, you know, but that the Russians are planning a major offensive. And in the next three or four months, the Ukrainians are planning a major offensive. And I've taken part in a giant counteroffensive, the Kharkiv counteroffensive, in which we literally smashed Russia. Just, you know, took back six major cities, just, you know, at over 300 villages, and really pushed Russia back to the border. Yes. Six cities, 300 villages, uh, all the way to the Russian border. Uh, But the rest of the line of confrontation has stabilized because the Russians suddenly realized after the loss of Kherson, the loss of Kharkiv province, most of northern Donbass, uh, the the giant pocket that they were trying to create in Liman, that collapsed. We just smashed them and pushed them beyond it. Right now, they have set up defensive positions all the way along the line of confrontation. And you might see if you... You Google it, you'll you'll see they have these dragon teeth like anti tank rows that they're calling, you know, 
they're they're actually calling them like the Wagner line, right? Because PMC Wagner, the the, the military contractor mercenaries that work for the Russians, um, are are leading the way and setting up a lot of these lines, and they're even bringing in contract engineers from all over Russia to dig trench improvements so that the the few surviving soldiers that they have don't have to do that themselves. And they're very sophisticated uh, and well-placed. So with the exception of the, the area at Bakhmut, um, the line is, is, is being literally drawn in the dirt as defensive position. Um, the most activity we're seeing, of course, is in the central area, um, uh, in Donbass. And what you're seeing there is you're seeing the Russians have somehow got it in their head almost psychopathically, that the center of Donbass, east of, uh, sorry, west of Lysychansk, um, is, is their best hope to break through to the line, the Dnipro River, and segregate northern sector from central and southern sector. And the Ukrainians are, are using a very clever strategy. They used it last year in Severodonetsk, uh, and they allowed the Russians to just pummel themselves like smashing their heads on an anvil Hmm. and let them have ground but incrementally just inch by inch by inch and as president Zelensky said when they took the city of listed chance these are very small cities they're towns more like than cities um he said well we will have these cities back they have lost you know some crazy number like five or six thousand troops a thousand armored vehicles to take a couple of villages in town. And that's what's happening in Bakhmut. The Russians have just, you know, they've been given these orders. The orders are political. They are not, they do not make any, any military sense unless you consider that they, they feel that they can crack through the Ukrainian army line. News for them. There are a lot of reserves in the Ukrainian forces. We are not losing everything we have um, because we don't have to. And we allow this, you know, we give them this head against anvil strategy, and they're doing it now in Bakhmut. And by the way, they're using PMC Wagner as the lead assault group, which is great. But Wagner, interestingly, the areas that they're targeting are amongst the most mineral rich sectors of Ukraine. Now, granted, let's seize it. You're never going to be able to salt mine, uh, you know, where one of the towns right now, Sovodon, was it was a huge international salt mine. You know, I mean, just the salt that would go out around the world. So they have this weird Stalinist industrial mindset towards what they take. You know, it's like PMC Wagner, you know, trying to mimic executive outcomes in Liberia by going after only regions with diamond mines. So this is, you know, same thing with lithium mines. So these bizarre beliefs about what the army should be doing as opposed to standard military um, strategy, which is destroy the enemy force, right? Destroy yeah. the enemy army. And then you can walk into your, your diamond mine, whatever it is. Um, but that's what's happening there. Uh, down in Zaporizhia, they've stabilized the lines down there, but the Ukrainians had made some gains. Uh, as you know, down in Kherson, they lost 50% of their gains mm-hmm. from the beginning of the war. They're back across the river, um, and the Ukrainians are raiding across that river and, you know, are building up the resources to, to cross and then attack the Russians in, in a multi-axis attack. You know, you get behind that Russian line there, whether it's with commandos or partisans or, or whatever, uh, and that's some of the operations we were doing. There's nobody back there, right? You, you, you know, it's just lines of communication bringing food, logistics, uh, and fuel in. And they are insanely vulnerable. Even worse, every place I just mentioned to you mm-hmm. is deeply in the range of the, of the high-mobility multiple rocket launch system, the GIMARS. And uh, there's nothing that is out of Ukraine's reach that's within Ukraine territorial borders now. Um, and it is a, it's a surgeon scalpel that doesn't cut your throat. It cuts your a <laughs> <Right? laughs> And you bleed out in a matter of moments. 
you know, as opposed to a matter of minutes. So that has been a ruthlessly effective weapon system, especially since Russia's strategy appears to be to go to the Soviet. Um, they have this image that they're going to mass thousands of individual infantry soldiers, and they are going to swarm and run across Ukrainian positions and 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 defeat them with just manpower, which is you know, um, here's 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 what one of my guys said. Uh, in a recent operation, you know, our fingers get tired. And I think that's what the <laughs> Russians are relying on, right? Just shoot. I'm shooting so many guys, I have to take a pause. And that's when they're going to break through, right? Yeah, that's crazy. Now, you were in Ukraine before the invasion, studying the kind of reality on the ground and Russia's order of battle. How has Russia's invasion right. sort of panned out in relation to your expectations? Oh, well. <laughs> you know, I'm 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 famous in the United States for you know actually going on air in the pre-war, and it, to a certain extent, it's sort of you know I'm not a journalist. Mm. Let's, let's get some things. I've written ten books, and I, I spoke on television for seven years, but I'm not a journalist. I'm as I like to explain to people, I'm a spy that spoke on television, and it was my job to explain things. And when I went to Ukraine, the, the narrative that Ukraine was going to be pummeled and they were going to lose and, you know, insanely dangerous. And, you know, we were hanging out in cafes in Kiev having fabulous lunches. And these, you know, these people would drop in from New York that day and they'd be carrying their body armor and backpacks. And I know I went up to one very famous female journalist from CNN, a, a big war correspondent. I go. Put that away. I said, the biggest problem you're going to have is determining where you're going out for drinks tonight. <laughs> so that being said, I, I had yeah. gone in there a month in advance, and, and I knew there was an invasion coming. And having taken part in several major invasions, I knew I wanted to see what roads they would go down. What was the logistic structure on there? How many gas stations were at the crossroads? Which ones had diesel? You know, a lot of diesel, which ones were petrol? Um, which one, and one of the things that I found in Ukraine is that their gas stations are fabulous. You know, they're, they're famous for their Ukrainian fully wrapped, you know, press baked hot dog. And, and they're, they're like mobile liquor stores. They have just everything you could possibly imagine from a very cognac to French wines, uh, you know, canned ostrich. Mm. <laughs> if you go to Sokar, Azerbaijan, wow. one, but the Oko, the Sokar, the, you know, these gas stations were just had an entire, you know, five meter wall of liquor floor to ceiling. And I thought, if the Russians come here, they're just going to go to a dead stop. And, you know, I, I made that joke on air and it happened. <laughs> of course, it <laughs> they found the liquor and it was like party time. Whole con what 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 should have taken them a week to to patrol their way down the Kiev with all their armor took two weeks almost three weeks and not only they were being harassed but you know their indiscipline uh, showed uh, that they weren't really an army they were just a rabble of men there to loot and they started with the liquor. Um, I was also famous for making the prediction that you Kiev would never be taken. And I got into an actual on-air disagreement with the host, who's very famous. And I said, listen, I've, I've been in this city a month. It's the size of Chicago, you know, almost twice the size of Greater London. I mean, you know, it's, well, maybe not Greater London. If, if you included all the suburbs going all the way out to Heathrow uh, in every direction, I mean, maybe even a little bit towards Gatwick. Yeah, it might, it's the size of London. Uh, five million people and every one of them is making Molotov cocktails. I'm not joking. And, uh, and my God, when, when they beat the Russians around Kiev, so many of these little old ladies were disappointed because they had cases of Molotov cocktails. They never threw, right? Uh, dying to chuck them out of 20 story windows on top of Russians. And, uh, you know, it was just clear to me that it was just a physical impossibility. 
they didn't have the combat force to take that city. And no one in news media would believe that. Um, another thing that I did, uh, at a, at, I went to the Ukrainian front lines in, in Donbass, in Donetsk, uh, at what we call Z minus eight, Z day being the invasion, uh, eight days before the invasion. And I met with General Sierski, the commander of land warfare, and General Pavlyuk, commander of the Donetsk front. And just listening to these guys brief and hearing the journalists fret and everything, I know General Pavlyuk, who is now commander of land warfare. You know, they asked him, what, if the Russians come, can you fight them from the south? He goes, yeah, we can fight them. What about if they come from the north? Yeah, we can fight them. And I realized this guy who's being asked the stupidest questions on the planet, you could just tell he doesn't care what direction they And I thought, this guy is an, is, is an animal. They, I, I don't know if the Russians know about this guy, but he's going to kick ass. <laughs> and... He did. <laughs> His Good. headquarters at Avdivka, they still hold the village of Avdivka, which was 70 meters from the Russian front line. They still hold this place today. They have lost no ground in the joint operations area that was established, you know, between 2014 and 2022. And, you know, whatever came across, they just smashed it. You know, they just killed everybody. And they get bombarded, yes. Their headquarters was leveled, yes. But a place that I thought would be gone in the first hour of the invasion is still there a year later. Um, these Ukrainians have heart. Uh, they cannot be beaten. You cannot subjugate them. They like fighting. They are willing to sacrifice their lives to kill Russians. But first, they like killing Russians. So when you have that that mindset of the happy warrior you, you, it doesn't matter you know we we actually at one point when we were on the offensive that you know we had eight grenades each and a couple of guys said we're going to do like the ukrainians and they would pack a small dump pouch with rocks yeah <laughs> you know they would frag a bunker right and the russians you know the russians would scream and run or whatever and then they would chuck a rock or two just to freak the Russians out while screaming, right? Just, ah! you know, what we call the Cossack scream. <laughs> and these guys are real Cossacks. And the Russians have made a horrible mistake, okay? There's no beating them, in a, even in a stand-up combat situation. Mm -hmm. Malcolm, what inspired you to go out and fight in Ukraine? Well, you know, I had spent a month there. The people that I had met, um, you know, and... <laughs> To, to quote Liam Neeson, I have a very particular set of skills. <laughs> um, you know, I you know people know me as a, a cryptologist, and yes, I was a cryptologist. I was what we call a cryptologic linguist. Um, you know, we don't just we're not interpreters, right? We're 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 spies. We're people that monitor communications and interrogate people and and do all these fun things. However, um, you know, for a good part of my career, I was a special operations cryptologist. It's a very highly specialized field in uh in in special operations you actually have a regiment for it now which has all these very bizarre people the special reconnaissance regiment and um you know they're they're half special forces half spy you know half intel and spies and then there are other groups that i've worked for which you know they you you're either behind enemy lines or you're in an you're in a country so you know uh so i had a good base of tactical knowledge uh which i had years and uh, i you know i worked as an intelligence and security contractor in iraq for on and off 10 years uh survived multiple suicide bombings um and uh and, and so i just you know i knew war in the middle east i mean my first operation was beirut in 1983 you know so from 1983 up until 2022 i mean i um i trained libyan rebels mm. so uh, I was brought on board as part of the defense intelligence apparatus to assist them here, the Ukrainian intelligence. Uh, and then uh, when uh, when I felt that I was uh, had contributed enough, I, I well, I, to do this, I joined the International Legion. And uh, that had started on February 28th, mm. 2022. And I joined on March 5th uh, out of the, uh, the Ukrainian embassy in washington 
and they took one look at my resume and they were like, we need you to call this person. <laughs> and uh, the person that I called was one of the deputy directors of Ukrainian defense intelligence. And they were like, yeah, get here, come to Kiev, you know, bypass that Legion stuff. <laughs> we have work for you. Uh, and, but while I was there, I realized I had to have Geneva Convention status. So everyone who works with the Ukrainians now, um, it has to be in the Ukrainian army. Yeah. Uh, you, to, you know, I actually got them to the point where everyone that works with either defense intelligence has to be a legionnaire. So there are three branches of the legion. There's there's that apparatus. There's which is their their most secret, not secret program. They have Twitter pages now. Uh, but then then I transferred to first battalion, which was on the Kharkiv front. Yeah, and um, and that we were holding 25 kilometers of trenches and observation posts, and they had no intelligence. So I went there, and you know there were visual reports were going into space. <laughs> right, and it's like, what? If you see something, does anyone know? And they were like, "Yeah, well, we tell our platoon commander, and if he wants to, he'll tell the company commander." And they had a horrible company commander who told no one. And they were bombarded. They were having headquarters blown up because of their cell phone usage and their VHF radio usage. Just a disaster. They had no intelligence uh, at all. And so we integrate. I integrated all of that. Uh, so and. You know, our own headquarters was destroyed uh, through a Russian bombardment, which fortunately killed no one. But, you know, when you're hit with an eight inch naval gun, (laughs) a 203 millimeter artillery shell, you know it. Yeah. Um, And and it was uh, but we had been bombarded regularly there. And um, and then uh, and then I was uh, asked to join the third battalion, International Legion Special Forces Battalion. Uh, and uh, and worked with them and took part uh, as a special forces uh, guy in, uh, well, we say special forces. I, I, I don't like to use special forces. I like to say special operations because we don't have 10 years of training. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> we These people who have very good uh, tactical skills uh, and operational skills, we are special operations because the missions we carry out are genuinely five to ten kilometers behind enemy lines, and oftentimes you're 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 targeting, or you're doing a very specific direct action. Some missions you are not supposed to shoot. Right, mm. a lot of people are going to know you're there uh, in the middle of the night as we were about to extract. We we successfully done our reconnaissance. Um, a T seventy two moved within like, you know, two hundred meters of us, and the javelin got. Oh, javelin time. We were like, and we will all die. Mm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we had to, you know, you want to talk about a guy who bitched and moaned the whole way out, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the entire track. Um, but we called artillery on it and, and they took care of it. Yeah. yeah. So, so that, that, that's what I did up until I, I left. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Malcolm, what's it been like fighting against Russian forces? Because obviously there was expectations that they would do better than they actually have. I mean, and you painted a bit of a picture that a bit ill-disciplined. I mean, what's it actually like sort of going against them? Well, you have to understand something. Their best forces died in the first month of this war. Mm. That's period. Done. You know, when all of the fighting, the, 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 that's not the VDV, uh, the armored forces that... that jumped into Hostomel uh, Airport. Uh, and that was the cream of the Russian forces. Uh, and they slaughtered. I, you know, I use that word a lot when I do interviews yeah. because that's the only way to describe what happens to Russians when they, when they do a stand-up fight. They don't win. Uh, and they win badly. They lose badly, let me put it that way. Mm-hmm. So... Early on in the war, and believe me, I was chomping up my bit to get out there. But you know, I worked for I worked for an agency, so we had other stuff to do, as we had a massive battlefront, you know, something almost two thousand kilometers long. And um, you know, the the Russians early on proved that they weren't actually worthy of this invasion. Um, and the, what happens during the daytime, right, which is Javelin Festival. Um, at nighttime becomes essentially um, 
Have you ever seen the movie Last of the Mohicans? Yes, yes. Famous movie uh, based on real events that happened. So the Russian army at night is sort of like that scene in Last of the Mohicans where the British forces surrender at Fort uh, Fort Ann and, and start marching back through the field and the Indians just come, wipe them out. That was night Ukraine. If it had wheels on it, it was destroyed. If they had, you know, if, if, if they carried fuel, fuel was the number one targeting priority early in the war. If it was a few, don't hit the tank, hit the fuel truck, you know, because a tank, you know, one, we can capture that tank. <laughs> Those guys will abandon it. You'll see photos of tanks abandoned in the mud. And the reason they abandoned them in the mud uh, during the daytime, they couldn't extract and they left was because they know what was going to happen at night. The partisans were coming out. The special forces were coming out. The territorial defense guys who were ignoring orders and just going around the enemy lines and going into the rear so they get their kills, they're coming out. They will literally have their throats slit. So the Russians aren't stupid. They abandon that stuff rather than die. So And it happens everywhere. Whoops, sorry, I just got an air raid alert from Kiev. So... Um, that that's just the nature of this fight. Yeah, that the Ukraine had every every dimension, even in the air. Mm. Uh, you know, they they smartly kept their air force on the ground, and, and let air defense create a blocker wall that the Russian air force just could not penetrate outside ten fifteen kilometers at the Russian border. So uh, the Russians. Oh, but well, let me sum up. They suck. They suck at this. <laughs> They're not an arm. Um, now, if you get them in a good defensive position, we just had this incident recently. If you get them in a good defensive position, they're, they're, you know, you got to root them out. And they're hard to root out because they've got, you know, they just don't want to die. And that's the only reason that they're fighting. And I'm a big advocate of giving them options. Uh, you know, but the, the Ukrainians aren't like that. They're not going to send a guy over, you know, drop a, a note from a drone saying, hey, you guys give up. You're going to be under the International Committee of the Red Cross's care uh, in a fed three times a day in a facility that is not run by the Ukrainian army. And if, you know, if you give them that option, I think a, a lot of them in mass would, mm. would defect. Mm. But, uh, you know, there's the effect of you, you might have PMC Wagner behind you. And they start shooting you. The average Russian soldier is, let me put it this way. In some respect, I think the Iraqis were better fighters because the Iraqis would fight with heart when it was time to fight. I mean, even the terrorists. Like, well, you know, uh, uh, the, the Saddam Sadiyin was actually the lead terrorist group in Iraq for seven years. It wasn't ISIS or Al Qaeda, or what would become ISIS. It wasn't mm. Al Qaeda in Iraq. Mm. They were just commanders using their terrain, fighting for what they believed in. The Russians don't believe in anything. They believe that they need that washing machine. And the washing machine is not a joke. They are everywhere. They steal every effing washing machine in Ukraine. Yeah. Because in Russia, the yeah. small villages, they still do it Soviet style, where there is a collective laundry for the whole town. And a washing machine shows you have a luxury. And so they see these things in every house in Ukraine because Ukraine is a very up, a very middle class society. There's no poor people in Ukraine. They manage their wealth well. They just loot them, uh, and they're like, "I'm going to take this home to my wife, or I'm going to run a washing machine sales depot." Mm -hmm. I, the first position, um, which was at a Ukrainian science, uh, former Soviet science center, the command I knew where the commander's post was because it had. 10 washing machines lining his little office <laughs> my god i've seen photos I, I was trying to work out what the deal with that is so thank you for explaining that it's unbelievable it is everywhere yeah like i think we should just offer them all a washing machine and say <laughs> hey here, here's the washing machine if you guys had to eat we will make sure these washing machines you know you can take all the washers you need yeah <laughs>
Like it. So, Malcolm, we've spoken in the past about Putin's destabilization operations focused on the West. You know, 2016 election, Brexit, uh, Russian funding of far right parties in Europe and, and in the US. Right. So, how does Putin's invasion of Ukraine kind of fit into his wider geopolitical plans? Yeah, now would be a great time. I don't even know if my book is distributed in England. My, I wrote this in 2018, a book called The Plot to Destroy Democracy. Yeah. And it I think the subtitle was How Putin and His Spies Are uh, Undermining America and Dismantling the West. Yeah. And it's true. It was true at the time. Mm. Um, and I think that when Ukraine came up on, on the roster, he had thought that he had destabilized the West far enough that mm. he could get away with this by, because yeah. he had political parties. Uh, he was she, you know, the, the the Cambridge Analytica and Russian disinformation actually targeted the Scottish, the first Scottish referendum mm. and Brexit mm. way before they targeted Donald Trump. Uh, they were targeting and amplifying messages of all sorts of little separatist movements like the Basque separatists, the Catalonian separatists in, in Barcelona. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Texas secession movement, and the California secession movement, the leaders of both of them have moved to Moscow mm. uh, just bizarre. And um, I think that they felt that they had purchased enough political parties uh, in France, the United States, gotten Donald Trump into the presidency that these parties would protect them if no matter what they would do. And we now see that in the United States. Uh, with Marjorie Taylor Greene and this group, they call themselves the Freedom Caucus, who work for a KGB officer. <laughs> I mean, it's the most, and and they speak out. No more money for Ukraine, and Zelensky was a. And you know why are we fighting over there? Why are we sending our money over there? Well, it's simple. I mean, we literally the Ukrainians with five percent of what we could ever allocate are decimating 80% of the Russian army. Ukraine, uh, Russia used 80% of its advanced combat forces in this war, and they've lost more than, I would say, 60% of it, of every vehicle they fought into that country. Mm. They're gone. Mm. I mean, they're, they're now bringing in T-90s. We've just seen an influx of T-90 tanks, and uh, we're killing those things with drones. We're not stupid. We wait for them to coke and smoke. And uh, we put a mortar round down the hatch, <laughs> you know, $188,000 on a javelin. But how does that javelin and that mortar round equate to the destabilization of the West? Well, Putin had invested almost 15 years in buying political parties. He used his oligarchy, who had purchased virtually every empty apartment in London, um, as a, you know, and amazingly, these oligarchs, Instead of just, you know, using their money when they're caught, they would just disappear like a good mafioso. We're hiring lawyers and doing political and legal combat against government lawsuits, uh, you know, crimes that they obviously committed and using the Western system against them. Putin lived in Dresden, Germany, you know, and loved the East German Stasi. So he understood the vulnerabilities of the West. Um, now, how does this make him the kingmaker of Europe? How does it change the poles of, of, of leadership, which were originated in Washington and, and uh, creating this wall between, you know, of Washington's access of Washington to Europe, Western Europe? Putin thought if he invaded Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, he would not only swiftly gain control of the country, he would gain control of 25 percent of the world's flour. Ukraine produces 25% of the world's wheat. If you eat a bagel, one quarter of that is likely from that one country. Uh, it also sold the flour market to all of the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's why Russia has all these, you know, Sub-Saharan African dictators siding with them. Mm. Mm. Uh, but... This was a miscalculation. I, I, I think it was RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute in London, that did a study and found that um, General Gerasimov had assured Putin that in 2018, 
the Russian army with its new weapon system, its training, its organization, the number of weapons that they had was on equal parity in terms of combat skill, support, and lethality and tactical sense of the United States. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is fantasy-based, you know, fantasy football, let's call it that, you know, where you have just made up something in your head and you believe it. And they believe that there was nothing in the Ukrainian inventory they couldn't handle. Now, fast forward, let's, Let's see about those investments that Putin had made. If you recall the scandal that Donald Trump was first impeached for, it was because he knew he was going up against Joe Biden, uh, the current president, uh, found that his son had done some investing there, despite the fact that every person on his senior staff was neck deep in the pro-Moscow Putin movement um, uh, in Ukraine, including his chief of staff, his uh, his campaign manager, who worked for for Yanukovych uh, for years, destabilizing Ukraine so that it could go to Moscow and not to the West. So um, that that impeachment was because Donald Trump tried to stop the delivery of the 1,100 Javelin missiles that the Defense Department had allocated to Ukraine because they knew this was Ukraine's biggest vulnerability was armor invasion. And hey, you know, I, I'm a jab, I'm jab qualified operator. I did not kill anything with it. I, I literally went around offering cash to guys to let me have a shot at their <laughs> tank. Um, and our, 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 com our command launch unit broke. So we had 15 missiles and no, no way to launch them. Uh, you know, I was like, I'm going to be a javelin ace. The javelin is a deal breaking weapon system. OK, you shoot it, it will die. All right. It's hard. It, I would do the course. And the instructor was this old, salty Ukrainian who clearly spent a lot of time with the Americans. I mean, his uniform bleached out. He wore his hat ranger style. Uh, he had students that had he had students that had killed over a thousand Russian tanks, which I was. Guy has this guy as a trainer. They wouldn't let him go out to the field. He eventually went out, you know, started killing some tanks, and then they sent his ass right back. These guys knew how to use that operating system when the war started. They had broken out all of the war stocks, but it was Donald Trump who tried to, to cancel that delivery unless they, you know, they were extorting him and trying to blackmail Zelensky to making up a fake investigation of Joe Biden. That's how close we came to this. Putin, Paul Manafort, who worked for Yanukovych and Putin, uh, General Michael Flynn, former director of defense intelligence, who sat at Putin's right hand at a dinner and was paid $45,000 for a pro-Moscow speech, who now is crazy pro-Moscow. All right. This is the investment that Putin made over that 15 years. You know why it's a failure? Because the Ukrainian, just like that, you know, just like in the pre-war when I was on TV screaming, going, hey, I think you guys have miscalculated. The Ukrainians have an army. <laughs> you know, you're talking about you have 72 hours. I was just with these guys. They're going to kill people. And uh, I've never seen such happy warriors. Same thing with the election. Same thing with Putin's investment in destabilizing democracy. They, he thought he owned Western, the Westerners through cash now. And like a mafia, this is one of those mafia dons who's decided he's going to go out and kill, you know, the, the you know, Don Corleone. You mm. Know? Mm. And you, you know how that movie ends? I mean, in the, the second Godfather, everybody who went up against Don Corleone dies. And that's it's precisely what's happening here in Ukraine. The Russians just did not know who they were effing with. Uh, and does it hurt that, you know, we're like chucking in every weapon system in the world. Uh, but, you know, if Ukraine falls, uh, a, a new Iron Curtain starts. The Western democracy will fall. Uh, it's vulnerable. Now, interesting. Little aside, because we talked about this. I wrote that book in 2018, but in 2017, when I was drafting it, 
I was asked to do a TV pilot in the United States. And I just read it again this week for the first time since 30 March 2017. And I had predicted that Ukraine was invaded and that the Russians 15 kilometers outside of Kiev at the start of that story. And I, I said it to my agent to the other day, and she was like, she goes, you, I read this back in 2017 when you sent it to us. You know, it was one of those too impossible to believe mm-hmm. And here we are. Yeah, yeah. Well, gosh. Malcolm, we're kind of at a weird crossroads. We've got, obviously, this war's continuing at the moment. We've got Putin's future to consider, and obviously, the, you know, as you were saying about the future of democracy. A big question, I suppose, what do you think, what does the future hold with this crossroads we're at? I think the future looks good. Mm. I mean, you're talking about a, a, a global dictator who had his imperial goals to re-engineer the entirety of the global alliance since mm-hmm. World War II, where the Atlantic Alliance uh, would collapse. Uh, Donald Trump, and I, I blame Donald Trump on an enormous amount of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Putin and Trump had all of these, no, you know, just his interpreter meetings. No one knows what was said in there. Trump's entire worldview was framed uh, by Moscow. Uh, in 2014, when he went to the Miss Universe pageant and then had a, you know, a three-hour dinner with the top oligarchs of Russia, um, and then came out spouting the Russian line. He supported the invasion of Crimea. Um, you know, so when you buy a politician, you know, as influence, it degrades your own, na- your national sovereignty and your national will. Mm-hmm. So that's precisely what's happened here. Um, with Putin and, uh, and and the West. Now what has happened with the invasion of Ukraine is we have seen, oh, you, well, you, you know the phrase Potemkin village, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a phrase that was put up by Prince Potemkin for, uh, you know, a visit by the Tsar, or Tsarina, Catherine the Great. Uh, true to form, Russia has stolen the body of Prince Potemkin <laughs> from Odessa. Oh, my goodness. Right? They literally, literally stole the body, sarcophagus, everything, brought it back to Russia, which is a metaphor for this war. This is a Potemkin nation. They have no combat skill. God, third air raid in Kiev since we've been talking about it. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. So they have, no, they have no military combat force. They had no political body that could stand up to the West and could act as a substitute and re-engineer. So Moscow was the center of the European universe and America was just a vassal state with a Donald Trump right-wing white supremacist extremist nation. Still on the fence about some of that, but it's done. The Atlantic Alliance is strong. And how do I know? Well, last September during the counteroffensive, um, I got uh, our positions were moved past so fast um, that our forward, 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 tippy edge of the spear positions were, were by noon, we had started at four in the morning, by noon, artillery was pulling up to our position. And we knew that was a sign that the line was breaking quickly. Um, and we weren't supposed to go to our, our H hour plus eight positions for, for three more hours, so, which was to take another village which we didn't know had been taken in like the first hour. So um, I made this art- I this video of an artillery piece, an M109, shooting behind my bed. Head. Oh, yeah, I've seen and it. And I go, yeah, what now, bitches? <laughs> <laughs> About three weeks later, I put that on Twitter. It goes viral. And then Russian state television starts playing it day and night, saying this is the black, English-speaking, African-American, NATO officers. Mm. We're not fighting Ukraine. That's why our forces pulled back so they wouldn't confront. We're fighting NATO. Mm. From that day on, that has been their entire cause, you know, cause celeb. They're, to explain why they're getting their asses handed to them, uh, principally because they're trying to say now they're not fighting them. They're fighting the full might of NATO with NATO officers at cause the Ukrainians are all chickens. Well, <laughs> that's, uh, that's an interesting 
take on the world, but it shows you how far they've utterly fallen. Mm, mm, indeed. How do you think this war is going to end? Well, if, if I can give myself a plug here, I have a sub stack yep. called malcolm.substack.com. And I put in it, you can read it for free, my 2023 combat prognostication. Um, I, I believe that if Russia pushes this winter, it'll be a uh, just a massive reconnaissance in force, or as I call it, a range training exercise for mm. the Ukrainians. Mm. Uh, and then um, I, I don't think they'll be able to break through anywhere. Uh, but the Ukrainians, on the other hand, if they're going to do spring offensives, they're going to do spring offensives with what they have. Uh, they will do the same thing. They will press along the entire line, but they will probably have one or two offensive zones that they think that they can mask. Like, like when we did the Kharkiv offensive, they had hundreds of pieces of armor, which were not indigenous to those forces up there. Mm -hmm. It's like they, they have a massive armor fist and just smash through the Russian line. And I think that will happen again. Uh, you know, led by lots of mechanized infantry, lots of javelins, lots of, I mean, we even had helicopter support, if you can believe that. So, um, and HEMARS, and they're going to break through somewhere. And while the Russians are panicking over that breakthrough, there'll be another offensive and they'll break through down there. The Ukrainians have the operational tempo to win in their heads now. And it's great that, you know, we have computers in Germany and you know, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, that are running these scenarios with the, the numbers that they have, the terrain that they have. And the Ukrainians do that. Um, the Russians, on the other hand, it's just going to be a head against an anvil until their brains come out. Yeah, yeah. If they haven't. <laughs> and what more could the West be doing to help Ukraine? Well, first off, I'm I'm now a fan of giving Ukraine whatever they want. Yeah. I'd say now it's time to give them air power. I mean, it would take a year to spool up, but as air power comes in there, you can. Uh, they've already been given MiG 29s. Um, now, with Patriot, they can have a deep air defense, which you have to you have to understand. They're predicting a, a Iran Iraq style war of the cities, only one sided. They are waiting for the Iranian Zulfagar uh, ballistic missiles to come into the inventory. And there's nothing to intercept them except Patriot. Um, also, uh, if you push Patriot out far enough, you can make Russian airspace, mm. you know, unflyable. Mm. Uh, and you, you know, MiG-31s will have to move back further and launch further. But, you know, they're going to try to get those Patriots. The Patriots will be arraigned along the Dnipro River. Uh, and they can give very coverage uh, throughout most of eastern Ukraine. Uh, I'm, Patriots are not needed for cruise missiles. Patriots are needed for the uh, ballistic missiles. Um, I got to tell you, a weapon system everybody was very surprised at was the German Chapard air defense system. And back in early October, when the Russians were moving those Shahid drones mm. to uh, from Iran to Russia, the Ukrainians repositioned all of those away from the battlefront. We didn't need them. A stinger was. I went to Singer School too. There's another missile I didn't get to fire. Man, was I angry! And I had an <laughs> SU-34 at 900 feet. Yeah. So I was very angry. I could have thrown a rock into its engine. <laughs> so the the, the Jupard is just slaughtering these very slow propeller-driven drones. Right? They don't even have to shoot five or six rounds to kill these drones because they're like. They're like model airplanes. Yeah. Uh, whereas before, you can always use a Stinger on that. Stinger has been in the in the Polish uh, missile pylon have been used against um, cruise missiles very successfully. It's a good video of that. I was quite impressed. And I've 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 been I've had eighteen cruise missiles fly over my head and blow up within five hundred meters of me. So anything that can, <laughs> anything that can knock those things down in a perimeter around these major cities and stop the attack on infrastructure is, is, is great. Um, I'm also a big fan. They, somehow someone only recognized that the United States had 100 D, you know, um, demilitarized Avenger Humvee air short range air defense system. And it's a box that carries eight stingers. It has a 250 caliber machine guns or 150 caliber machine guns. And I thought, give them a hundred. 
give them all of them. They're great. Um, and uh, so I've been advocating for that since October. They're getting eight, I believe. Mm, mm. Is there anything listeners could be doing to help? Well, yeah. Uh, you know, President Zelensky himself said, no matter whether you're donating or, or just speaking out in favor of Ukraine, do something for Ukraine. Hey, I got to tell you, a third of my guys are Brit. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> You know, shout out to my buddy Maka, King of Drones, <laughs> Lincolnshire tea obsessed guy. I've ne- <laughs> never seen anyone. Literally hid the tea bags in our secret safe. Nice. And <laughs> you know, just just tea crazy. <laughs> um, but we have a lot of Brits and 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 French. Um, uh, we are starting a, a new foundation for for the International Legion. It's called the International Legion Foundation. Yeah. And right now, if you want to donate, you can buy lunch. Uh, I'm in France right now. We just bought a thousand meals, uh, pre-cooked, uh, hermetically sealed meals that will last two years, uh, because we're 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 in the front now. We're not we're not in the rear, mm-hmm. and uh, we generally can't have fires. We only have occasion. We have generators and hot water heaters, um, and so if you go to T A P S T R I. That's tapestry.org, P-A-P-S-T-R-I dot org. That's my think tank that I had before the war, the Terror Asymmetrics Project. There's a giant donate button there. You can press that button. You can donate uh, via PayPal or credit card, whatever you want to use. And you can literally support directly the 3rd Battalion International Legion, the Special Forces Battalion. I just delivered $117,000 worth of equipment this week including 1,000 French meals. Nice. <laughs> so, any any cassoulet in there? Uh, yeah, we do have cassoulet. <laughs> Look, a bunch of rabbit with yeah, rice. And, nice. Uh, so they have a paella oh, yeah. that literally has two shrimp, four mussels. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, less than a pound, almost a little bit over a pound, a pound yeah. 50 each. Yeah. So we're, bought, we're like, we're just going to ship in 1,000 meals a month. Stop they're just eating power bars and uh, power bars and energy drinks mm. when they're out on, on on the battlefront. Now they can pack these in their rucks and nice. and, and be happy. With. Good, good. Well, Malcolm, before we part ways, is there anything else that you'd like to add that's important to you that we may have missed? Well, you know, I don't usually recruit, mm. but if any of you have any skill, have, have active real military service, the International Legion is is recruiting. Uh, and, uh, you can go to the, you, you can actually come to Ukraine at right at the border. They'll send you right to our training facility. Uh, but you know, we get a lot of posers, a lot mm. of walls. Mm. Don't come. Mm. Don't come. We're going to check. Everyone there has skill, you know, has, has served in the forces. They know a loser. I had a guy fake that he was a Navy SEAL. And I was <laughs> like, oh my God. We called him. So we, we kicked him out with malice. Yeah. The point is, is that he was going around saying he was a combat medic. And he never had even studied medicine. Oh, so that God. lie could kill him. Yeah. You know, but uh, International Legion is going to be, you are a member of the Ukrainian army. It is not a militia. We have first line Western weapons. If you know how to shoot 50 cal in mortars, we're looking for those operators. But 1st Battalion, International Legion, the infantry is looking for manpower. And 3rd Battalion, the Special Forces, that's generally for people who have advanced infantry skills. Mm. Special operations, mm. not mm. special forces. And uh, guys who can really, you know, snipers. Um, one of our best snipers lives in London. An American had served in all three branches of the Legion, lost his hearing due to a tank round, you know. So, you know, he had a Barrett MRAD sniper rifle in 338 Lapua, and now we're short. Damn. So, yeah. uh, you know, but I can tell you what to do, but you can support Ukraine in a thousand different ways. Mm. So do something. Yeah, fantastic. Well, look, Malcolm, where can listeners find out more about you and your work? Oh, well, that's easy. I'm at Twitter, yep. at Malcolm Nance on Twitter. But right now, most of my, my best work is at is um, malcolmnance.substack.com. You can subscribe for free. Uh, you can read the archived articles back there. I just put one out that's very interesting called How Putin Will Die. Mm. And it's about how his internal enemies will have to, you know, the options they have to kill him from either his paying his bodyguards off or 
you know, if he goes to a nuclear bunker, nuking him out. Uh, the, you know, Russia, Russia could have any number of ways that that's going to happen. We're not going to do it, mm. but his allies are going to do it when their money stop. You know, the money stops coming. Mm. Mm. Well, Malcolm, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been great to catch up with you again. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, check back after the next yeah, assembly. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. 